observation. I uh, consider myself a Danish Texan. My dad's from Sulphur Springs, Texas. My mom's from Ørstebro in Copenhagen. And I just want to say I'm super impressed with all the Danes here. I knew that Christian was speaking this morning. but So if you're Danish, let me hear you. All right. And let me hear all the Sulphur Springs service designers. I'll let my dad know it's not the powerhouse I thought it'd become uh, in the service design world. So, um, so what we are uh, here to talk about today is the implementation dilemma uh, and how to build a sustainable growth engine within large established companies. Um, Munib and I were talking at the break. We're actually pretty jazzed at the conversations from this morning of the presentations. Um, a lot of what Billy's talking about with City, you'll see uh, um, represented here. Uh, not because we worked with City, but because um, he's really smart. <laughs> Okay. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the work that Ryan was talking about, on this stage, we attended the, um, the, the, the session um, with the team from Gatorade and Smart, uh, Gensler and uh, Eli Lilly, and they talked about building from within, the importance of prototyping and the importance of space. So um, I think that uh, a lot of uh, today um, is, is uh, aligned with, with some of our thinking. Um, I'm the Vice President of Customer Experience and Innovation Capability within Continuum, so I lead the practice helping large companies build their internal capacity, helping them create, launch, and scale new ideas and multi-touch point experiences. And as such, I get a chance to meet with companies across geography and across industry, and the number one issue that they have is not sourcing ideas, not generating ideas, not identifying new opportunities, but getting those ideas out into market and getting them commercialized and doing that as quickly and as cheaply as possible. So, and uh, I, I um, lead the design innovation team in uh, one of the iconic uh, service, uh, financial services organizations in, AMP, uh, in Australia uh, called AMP. And uh, our main business is um, retirement savings, uh, life insurance, and financial advice. We are the main kind of leaders in these three areas in Australia. So two, two years ago, we invited Continuum to help us to focus on a specific customer problem. And then we, John and I spent a lot of time uh, uh, working together on, on uh, uh, resolving this problem, as well as understanding how we actually build innovation capabilities in the organization. And what we turned out to find that actually implementation component was really difficult. So, and that's why we actually started consulting um, our, uh, academic literature, given my background that, that I teach um, creativity and innovation in uh, Australian Graduate School of Business. We started digging into uh, academic literature and as well as actually talking to a number of companies here in the US and Australia, try to understand how they actually handle this problem. And I'm really uh, pleased that, jo as John mentioned, that uh, this morning and today's conference overall was actually uh, addressing a lot of bits and pieces that we are we, we have been talking with the organizations and uh, consulting literature as well, and then we will give you some model how we think it should um, it should work. It, it's working at, at least at, in organization that I work, which is AMP. But it is, uh, I believe, this is the kind of starting point that we can all build together this model further, which will actually help us to be much more definite when we, do, when we start working on implementation of ideas. All right, so this is a, a work in progress in terms of evolving, so feel free to tweet, email, call, text uh, with feedback. Um, my mom is on Twitter and she thinks I'm really smart and special, so just be kind with your feedback. So. Um, all right, so everyone in this room knows this and um, large companies are feeling this, right? You either disrupt or get disrupted. We have high customer expectations. We have a tremendous amount of information and the transparency that comes with that information. We have new entrants, we have startups, we have a uh, global economy and the competition that comes with that. So what does that mean? That means that if you're a large company, or in many cases, entire industries, you have to adapt, you have to figure out how to address um, these challenges and do that in a sustainable way. And a lot of this we've talked about today uh, across sessions. Um, this is great news for all of us, right? I'm particularly fond of the upper right solution, uh, but there are many other solutions. Um, the, uh, the, the, and, and there's, there's many more beyond these, right? So innovation toolkits and design thinking training across employees. Um, hiring designers in-house, hiring consultancies, crowdsourcing, corporate venturing, um, building innovation centers and labs internally. Um, there's, there's some tremendous energy and excitement going on there. Um, 
Here's my concern. Um, all this activity, all this action, does not necessarily equal outcomes. And by that we mean um, impact in the market. Uh, we're, what, 80 blocks from uh, the Apollo. And those of you that remember the Sandman, that's, that's what I, uh, I sweat as a, as a designer, which is we have tremendous opportunity to reshape the world and drive real change in businesses. Um, but if we don't figure out how to move our ideas, our new experiences into the market effectively, repeatedly, consistently for big companies, the CEO is going to say, that's great that I hired designers, that's great that I have some nice furniture, a nice space, or I have some training, um, but I'm not getting business results. And just like the Sandman, <laughs> it's going to come sweeping along and move on to whatever the next thing is. And that'd be a travesty. Um, so uh, what does that mean? That means that we think that companies need to focus much more on the implementation side because they can get the ideas from a lot of places that we talked about, right? So our central thesis is that we believe that established companies underestimate their ability to create or acquire new ideas, and they overestimate their ability to implement them. And that makes sense, right? An operating company is a giant implementation engine. It is a machine that pumps things out. But the problem is, that those ideas that are truly valuable, the ones that are meant to get out into the market uh, and, and really drive growth, drive customer delight, don't fit well um, with uh, this, uh, this uh, traditional implementation. And this is why. The best ideas are also seen as the riskiest ideas. So what we talk about at Continuum is this notion of the scary zone. It's just past incremental change, which is your chocolate flavor, your now with lemon scent, your half point off the mortgage with a delightful concierge uh, that, uh, that a competing bank or financial services company offers. Um, and that fits well within, uh, within an organization. The other flavor of, of innovation uh, that, that companies can frequently um, revel in is what we call cold fusion. And those are those far off ideas that are grand and exciting they have a tremendous amount of, of um, um, sex appeal, like me. <laughs> um, I'm the cold fusion. Of, yeah. um, but but here's, the, here's the challenge. Um, they are technically unfeasible in the current state. They're too expensive, or they're waiting for um, mass adoption. And so there's a lot of companies that rely on this kind of innovation, because they can check the box and say, look, we are innovating. It's not our fault that we can't do anything about it. The time hasn't come yet. And companies frequently sit between those two. But the real value, the ones that will drive growth in an organization, the ones that are um, uh, most delightful to customers are the ones that sit in this risky area called the scary zone, which are ideas that can be made today. They just don't work easily with existing structures. So if we look at this as the silos, right? Incremental change uh, works well within the traditional bureaucracy, structure, committees, policies, procedures, roles, responsibilities, and all the other silos and things that come along with a, a company working at scale. And cold fusion is so untethered from uh, uh, adoption and implementation at a large company that it's much more blue sky. But the scary zone, that's where it messes with silos. It messes with uh, traditional implementation. So um, the scary zone ideas doesn't play well with the structures, um, and this especially in the large established organizations. So I'm sure there are many factors what, what influencing that, but we actually identified these four groups. So the first one is uh, usually com companies are focusing on inside out problem, which means what is, what is the problem within the organization, how we see the world, neglecting customer value or understanding customer. And we talk about this empathy a lot. The second one is, well, we actually traditionally jump into solution mode immediately implementing and scaling up business uh, without actually having proper conviction and test with the customers. Uh, is this really valuable to customers? And that's why uh, very often we spend a lot of money, but we don't know what is the outcome, what is the final outcome that we can expect. So, uh, and, and especially traditional organizations with a long, uh, a long time in existence, they actually create a lot of processes, procedures, um, risk procedures as well, which are constraining and narrowing down the maneuver to actually change some things. And therefore, uh, it is very hard to actually bring the this, this scary zone idea into that environment because there are many constraints attached to it. 
And finally, the fourth one is that uh, companies are measuring success in traditional ways. So uh, what's the cash flow that I'm generating, how much profit I'm making, what's my return on investment, and things like that. So we're not saying that it's wrong to measure in that way, but probably there are some steps between we start actually measuring that and, and, uh, uh, after we get the conviction that we are focusing on the right problem. So this is where we, we come to this in, uh, the central part of our, what we want to talk to you is the implementation dilemma. We see two things. One is the new ideas taken and implemented in traditional way, how we do this today, or new ideas, uh, new ideas taken from scary zone and implemented in the new way. So let's remind ourselves uh, uh, what is actually a traditional way of doing it. So we, we have a new idea. We usually put this in strat plan, and, and we say this is the problem with we think it will work. Put it in strat plan, and then what we select a group of people, build the business case based on account and assumptions, then start actually working uh, and hand over to the team to develop the initiative. Halfway through, team actually stu stuck, is stuck with a couple of questions. So, well, what's the customer value proposition here? How it's actually, what, how sh should, what should I develop in the line with customer proposition? Or is there, what's the customer desirability? Are we actually addressing with this development the right thing that we need to do? Um, do we have enough resources and things like that? And this is where risk assessment start playing and saying, well, we need to actually, to avoid the risk, we need to deliver these initiatives on time and on budget. So what we usually do in that situation? We de start descoping the project. And we deliver that on time and uh, on budget, but we don't actually move the dial much for customers, but we don't move the dial for the organization too. So this is the situation that we call nice landing wrong airport. <laughs> so, to avoid nice landing wrong airport, what we think, uh, what we actually found it works uh, well, is that we actually focus on the problem and then we do risk assessment. Are we actually addressing the right problem first? And in doing that, the best tool is actually to build the customer case instead of business case at the beginning. So then we, what, we, uh, what we found is we're working very well when we uh, start actually building these idea base, ideas based on customer experience and customer understanding, prototyping this idea, making sure that we, have a, we are convinced that we are going into the right, right trajectory, uh, placing smaller bets uh, in, in, in the market test. And then, once we have a conviction, we actually start thinking about how can we build a business case because it will be developed on factual situation, not assumptions, accountants assumptions. What we learn through these processes. And that's what we believe actually creating more than just moving dial a bit. It creates significant change for the organization. So, so what's the implementation solution? So we believe that this second approach in actually in creating environment, as some of the speakers already mentioned these things, that we need to create new ecosystem or some kind of infrastructure or whatever capabilities. But what we're saying that the central part of, uh, and the good, kind of good news for this implementation solution is that we don't need to actually change um, people, resources, and things like that. We just need to uh, reposition them in different way. So repositioning in different way means that we, we work on this to change the mindset that it, the, whatever we build, it should start from customer in center of attention. So then we, we actually have, we develop some uh, approaches, tools and methods that people can practice and they, they so talk the same language. No, then avoid any further confusion. So we, we believe that central part of this implementation solution is what we call that an implementation pod. An implementation pod has two main components. One is what we call that core team of dedicated people sitting in that pod, collocated, and working together in the way I described uh, the, uh, earlier. This is the new way of doing so, placing smaller bets, understanding customers, and things like that. But we also say around this team should be, as you see on the picture, it would be extended team, which is actually dialing up and down work as, as, as required for the project dynamics. 
So that's what we will believe that we'll actually turn this and then and the, the situation from, from actually focusing just uh, on, on what we believe the internal measures and internal values more on customer values too. So there are uh, three critical factors, uh, elements of this um, uh, implementation pod and three enablers and John and I will address them in a little bit more details now. So the three critical elements of an individual pod are an empowered team, physical space, and a common approach and tools across them. Uh, first, the, the empowered team. Um, <coughs> an empowered team is uh, a core team of five to seven individuals pulled from the core business. And these um, team members are dedicated full time on the pod through the course of the development of this, this offer or this multi-touch point experience. Um, a client once told me that availability is not a competency, which I think is an excellent point. So these, um, uh, these, these people that you bring in need to be the best of the best. It has to hurt a little to pull them in, uh, but they're also gonna, they're gonna come in and contribute uh, much more rapidly than if you have um, uh, you know, what we call in, in uh, Texas the, the, the tallest midget. So you want, you, want, you want a great core team, five to seven dedicated full time. They're led by a design lead, and a business lead. So those are co-leaders uh, of, this, of this particular pod, and both of them report into an offer owner. The offer owner is a senior leader, uh, never more than two levels away from the C-suite, uh, and they are held accountable and are responsible for getting this offer into the market to test. Could fail, but the idea is to get it into the market to test. Now, a lot of times, uh, and especially even on this road show that Munib and I have been on, um, Concert t-shirts are on the way. Um, the roadshow we've been on, we've talked to a bunch of different organizations. Um, the idea of an empowered team sounds, um, sounds on the surface uh, quite common, but by this we actually mean no sign-offs with functional leadership while they're working in the pod. So every team member uh, is contributing and representing their functional area. They're making the trade-offs, they're making the decisions, uh, and they're doing that um, with no uh, running back to their functional leadership until we get into market and are looking at potentially scaling the solution. This drives speed and this drives um, uh, expediency in terms of uh, uh, protecting the, the uh, consumer intent around the idea. So what you, what you see on this picture here is the, an example at AMP that uh, we have a core team and an extended team working together and discussing in the pod where they're discussing uh, the uh, up, updated uh, work that they, that they have been, uh, the core team was developing. So, and then uh, after this, there were, there were kind of decision making point where, where what's the next step for the project? Second critical element is physical space. And as designers, you all know this, and um, I think a, quite a few of us take this for granted. Um, I know that, that I do, uh, given the space that we work. We work out loud. Um, but in large organizations, that's taken for granted. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the importance of this. I think it's a given uh, and, and commonly understood that you have to drive behavior change if you wanna drive innovation in a large company. Um, but so often, behavior change comes in the abstract. Start acting collaborative, start doing this, start doing that, think out loud, share, share more, build upon each other's ideas. Um, but in doing some research, we actually found this model uh, that's fantastic and it actually reinforces some of the thinking and learning that we had been doing, which is if you change the environment that people are working in, they start to change their behavior. It reinforces, it reminds, it encourages, and that's fundamental to working as a pod. So critical to a pod is that that five to seven um, uh, member team uh, and their co-leads co-locate into a shared space. They work out loud, whiteboards, foam core, and the like. They bring in their extended team members that are experts in various functions uh, as necessary um, to help um, uh, evolve the idea. And importantly, you now have a different governance model. Your steering committee members no longer get a pre-read and quarterly sit down in a boardroom and you report out to them with Harvey balls and red and green and yellow lights. Instead, they come down to that physical space they have a stand up where they're getting the updates from the core team. They're understanding the nuances of both the business requirements and the customer requirements, and they make real time decisions with each other there, and that drives speed to market. So what we found amazing, actually, this theory, uh, we, th we found this uh, later. We, we established this innovation center at AMP two and a half years ago, and then we, we hoped that people would start collaborating. And 
we, we were surprised with the changing, uh, how people change their behavior in working. So uh, within two weeks, we had um, 10, of, uh, 10 or 12 teams working in this space, actually not sitting in, in the chairs, standing in front of the whiteboards and using markers and, and uh, uh, discussing and collaborating. Two and a half later, we have a multiple pl places like this across the organization. On every floor, we now have a whiteboard, and uh, I can see all meeting, many meetings rooms are empty because people are standing in, the, in front of white whiteboards and actually discussing the problem for the project and how they develop it. What you see in this space here is this is core and extended team, people from nine, nine different disciplines across the organization debating what's on the whiteboard and the, what's the artifacts that they have, they have been developed. But also all of them in some point of time were vis visiting these customers that you see kind of blurry pictures of, on, on the wall on the other side. And the third critical element of an individual pod is a common approach and tools. Uh, so I want to unpack this a little bit. The, the critical takeaway on this is that there's no handover. So you think of the game of telephone when you're a child, you whisper something, red circle, and it comes out as a green rhombus. Like, oh, it was Gary, you know. Um, the, uh, the idea here is that there's never a handoff. The core team, business, design, all the critical functions start at the beginning in framing and understanding the challenge all the way through to in-market test. So at no point does one or the other side of the equation disappear. They work all the way through. The other thing that's, that's uh, important to keep in mind is that because of that, um, there's different roles that happen. So the emphasis or the level of ownership and decision making moves from front end and what those customer requirements are to the business-led side as you move into business requirements. Um, other than that, um, they work collaboratively throughout the whole process. So what we learn in this uh, process that the, just establishing these pods doesn't work if we don't actually create these enablers. So what, uh, the, what we found, we found is kind of three large groups of that. So one is uh, training people, second one is new, new risk appetite, and third one is radical transparency. So the first one, um, the training people, um, so what we found actually that if, in, in order to empower people and give them authority and, and then actually have a new way of working in the, in the, in the pods, in, the spa in these spaces and taking new approaches and methods and tools require people to be informed about that and then be knowledgeable about it. What we found in the early stage of development that in a core team who was very familiar how to run prototypes, how to do things, uh, how to run tests and things like that, the rest of the teams, for extended team and other teams surrounding these uh, pods, they were not actually familiar with it. So then what we found actually, in, and then created some tensions, because they're all rightly doing all the uh, jobs that they are asked to do. So what we found that if we actually put these uh, approaches together, what, what John was talking about, and then help them to understand that, in this situation, when we say prototype, then everybody would understand what prototype is. And when person from legal, we're working as a subject matter expert from extended team into core team, and when people in core team say, we are going to do prototype, oh, it's not question, is this something that we actually um, do and things like that. Do we experiment in the organization? Everybody knows about that. These people should know about it. But what is also important and what we learn, then senior leaders need to be aware of that as well. So then all our leaders went through this uh, training and now we have a, uh, for some pe limited period of time, our senior leaders, including CEO, have a design partners working with them and helping them to actually go through this process. So most importantly, we don't have actually intention to turn entire organization into designers. The idea is that people have a common language, that they, have a, uh, that they understand the tools that they're using. And, uh, and we actually see that it is working and we're actually using that as simply as possible way. If we need to go for some specific uh, parts of the organization, we go deep dive and we help people actually like service designers, service designers will be built on that because this is just basic stuff. So second, um, second uh, enabler is the re new risk appetite. What we mean by that, is, um, so we mean by that that, that we, we accept the notion that it is important to have these prototypes and in-market tests. And the people need to be uh, comfortable when we actually starting talking about these things. Um, and second, second thing is, Placing smaller bets in the market means that 
again, we try to test these things, but within actually some boundaries. It's not like, you know, infinite, sp infinite space that we can do whatever we think it should, but all teams can do. So, for example, in, in our kind of risk assessment, we are saying that the f uh, there are ma two main things that we can't actually, we have to have if we go to test with the market. So one is that all this regulatory compliance should be in place. And the second one is that we need to have exit option if we fail on this, te this test. So that this we, we, we teams can't start doing this if they don't have an answer for these two things. So um, the third one is, unlike startups, uh, large established companies, they have a legacy. They es establish um, their brand reputation. They establish their customer base. And it is risky for them to go to experiment. And I heard that you know, in many organizations that we, that we visited, that they are saying that's the, that's the biggest problem. To what extent, some, some companies are saying, well, we are going to smaller markets and test this because we don't want to actually put big risk in, in our main markets, for example. But well, what we think it is important that actually when we do these experiments, that we, we, have, we do have high fidelity front end and then low fidelity back end. So the example of what we do, we're doing uh, in, in uh, AMP is that in a new, new initiative which we call live services, we created these services on our website and people can interact. But we, we, and we also created small pod in call center and people are calling this call center and they're interacting and re requesting services if they, if they are interested in these services. Inste we, we build this call center, in small call center, instead of actually building entire platform. And as you imagine, if we build entire platform, it will cost us millions of dollars. But having three people, five people three months in call center responding on calls doesn't cost millions. So, and, and that's the kind of point that is important to have these kind of two connections for large organizations, established organizations, to minimize the risk, but at the same time understand, is there a demand for this? And the point is to measure the demand. So, and, and last thing is, uh, what we believe in this phase, while working in the pods with coin extended teams, it is important to focus on me uh, measure in, and measure return on learnings, instead of return on investment, because it's too early. We don't know how many widgets, and it's no point to, uh, to, uh, to see how many widgets we are going to sell. The point here is, what are we going to learn, why people are engaging with us on this specific offer that we designed for them. And the last thing uh, in, in, in terms of enablers is radical transparency. I heard uh, a lot of people talking about importance, uh, people from GE and, and some other uh, um, speakers this morning, they're talking about importance of communicating. So in the past, it, when, when we started actually uh, building these R&D functions, we actually say uh, they, they should be in some part of the organization and nobody would know what they are doing. Or we actually put some skunk work team to do some uh, job uh, or project which the rest of the organization doesn't know. So what we found actually that uh, with this uh, implementation pods, it's important that people are transparent. And uh, our teams are going and talking, using brown bag lunches, using these uh, check-in sessions, recording really ro low resolu resolution videos, using iPhone and creating what, peop what do people internally feel about that when they work on these projects. And then distribute that through our intern internet side and things like that. What you see here on, on the slide is a kind of different situations when teams are actually briefing the rest of the organization, whoever is interested to hear that. And then there, there is on the left hand side, this is kind of internal chat debate. What, what is this, some su suggestions for ideas or to consideration and things like that. So what you see here is one of the, our um, minimum viable offers that we, uh, that we build called living expenses. I can't talk more details because we are testing with this very small number of customers. Uh, but you know what, what I would say that the benefits applying this implementation pod uh, uh, strategy and in creating these enablers helped us actually to establish some sustainable engine to build these initiatives which we believe that are focusing on the right problem. So, and also it's helped us understand that if we don't, uh, if it doesn't create value for customers and if we, if we recognize that we should stop doing that. And it helped us to uh, create uh, multiple minimum viable offers and have them in market testing as well as pipelines of prototypes that we have in place, but not all of these prototypes will go in market testing. 
So most importantly, we are now shifting mindset of our people and their behaviors that they realize that they're working through these uh, space uh, innovation spaces that we discussed and then understanding these tools and, and simplicity of uh, what, how they can apply in the day-to-day -day activities create enormous value for them. We trained hundreds of people uh, to date, and, but in the most importantly, we're now getting signals that people are very much engaged in what we call customer-centric strategy, and also they are telling us they really understand what is actually customer-centric strategy now. So here's what's super cool is um, this notion of a portfolio of MVOs. So these MVOs are por portfolio of pods uh, with MVOs or, or concepts and offers inside. Um, what this means is that you have a core team that's exposed uh, to the practical use and application of this work. You have an extended team that's working uh, to, to come in and help. And in some cases, they may be on another core team. And as you run these portfolios along with the training, uh, you start to impact the entire organization. You start to get new uh, uh, mindsets, new shifts, and you start to drive customer centricity while creating a stream of offers. The other thing that's important is that these ideas are now able to transition to the business, the optimized efficient engine that is really good at scale. So we think of this as like a lock in the Panama Canal, right? You have new ideas, they move in as a pod, and you start to build them, you test them, you iterate them, you're tightening your business assumptions, you're getting higher conviction, you're protecting the integrity of the idea, and as leadership starts to gain confidence in it, you reach the high water mark, the lock opens, and that concept can move in for scaling as appropriate. So the long and the short, you gotta get these scary zone ideas out. If you're a large established company, the way that you currently work, the way you currently implement, is antithetical to that, but if you can find the right methods, the right approach, uh, and, and the, uh, the, the right way to, to leverage your existing resources and teams, um, while you can't mitigate the risk entirely of innovation, you can actually shrink the size of the scary zone and start to get ideas out to market in a repeatable and consistent way. Thanks so much. Thank